is never too late. That is the message of Yom Kippur every year. Jane Fonda famously said, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Now, whilst that may be rather difficult retroactively, it is not too late for us to have a good life, another go at making things easier, better, fuller for ourselves and those around us. That constant movement of improvement is possible because if it weren't, what would be the point of us living? The unexamined life, wrote Socrates, is not worth living and truly Yom Kippur and the tradition of reflection at this time is just that, a moment for examination and reflection. And frankly, you are all here tonight because you seem to agree with this tradition too. This tradition you've inherited and its invitation to you. Dan Gilbert, Harvard professor in philosophy and psychology says, human beings are works in progress who mistakenly think that they are done. <laughs> Yom Kippur is there to remind us that this is not so. We know that every life eventually ends and that's what Yom Kippur offers us, a rehearsal of our death and a challenge to think more expansively in our own lives. Make peace with contradiction and difficulty. People in our lives who disappoint, even as we are devoted to them, perhaps parts of ourselves that disappoint and shame us. Patach libi, we just read in our liturgy, open my heart. As long as we are breathing, it is not too late to try for that open heartedness. Tonight, I want to remind us all that whatever stage of life we are in, it is never too late to think, to be creative and to be open. Post COVID, as I said, in our first full Kol Nidre sanctuary for three years, I wonder if we might reject the shrinking of life that COVID demanded and its aftermath of worry and concern, and, ex and instead expand our expectations and possibilities. This is very much my task this year. Many years ago, over 30 years ago, when I read Alice Walker's Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Color Purple, it changed my life. Walker brought alive for me Martin Buber's theology of connection, I and thou, before I had fully understood it. She told the story of a God found in human friendship between her protagonist, Nettie, and her friend, Sugar. And as I said, it changed my life, my faith, my trajectory, possibly my career. Ten years later, I discovered this very same book had released an Orthodox rabbi from his own shame, gave him the courage to come out and move into the liberal Jewish world. The book is truly beautiful, which is why it has been so profoundly disturbing to watch Walker's descent into a vitriolic and poisonous Jew hatred as she voices in re recent poetry and journaling, which she has now published. Her refusal to allow the color purple to be translated into a writ is not in my books necessarily hateful, but these remarks and intent are where Jews are her target. Palestinians, she describes, as the latest victims of an ancient evil perpetrated with impunity and without conscience by a chosen people. Surely this is hate. Or her 2017 poem, are goyim meant to be slaves of Jews and not only that, but enjoy it. In the postscript to her new book, she wrote, I have no regrets. And has it seems been promoting since 2012, David Icke's extraordinarily offensive book, The Truth Will Set You Free, where amongst other outlandish claims, he recommends children debate at school whether Jews paid for the Holocaust themselves. It is abhorrent. But should we cancel Alice Walker and all her previous war work or do we talk of it all 
in the same sentence, make it, cl make it clear that it is all hers, all of it belongs to her, the beauty and the rest that appalls and offends. Likewise, it's dismaying to comprehend the hatred for Jews held by Roald Dahl, Virginia Woolf, Charles Dickens, many others. A vast list of writers who disappoint in their ugly prejudice, but we mustn't excuse or blame historical context. Rather, turn all of it over in the palms of our hands, all part of one person and their work so that we needn't reject all of it, but hold them to account, yes, feel the full impact of their occasional abhorrent beliefs alongside the things of beauty they have created. This, I acknowledge, is not a popular response in our reactionary climate, but I do firmly believe it is possible to hold both truths in the balance of judgment. It's inconvenient, but glaring and insistent. People are varied and full, and these books line my bookshelves and, frankly, my passageways through life, honestly, robustly and courageously. And yet it is irrefutably true that these writers and many others held and continue to hold abhorrent views that I reject. Yet for the sake of my soul, I will not cancel them. Think of the state of Tennessee earlier this year banning Art Spiegelman's mouse because they declared it offended children. I like to think we are more than that. There are huge inconsistencies out there in the world and internally in each one of us. And I think in some ways Yom Kippur is about reflecting those glaring juxtapositions. We are told to choose life even when for many of us that is not straightforward. It's messy and full and requires us to think and discern every day of that life. Teshuva is about fullness and managing what hurts is part of that fullness. Tomorrow we'll read the story of Jonah, who is about as far from self-aware as it is possible for anyone to be. He manifests oppression at every turn. He resents growth and resolution in the Ninevite people. He is furious and personally affronted by their return, their teshuva towards God. And yet, he is the prophet that we study and read on Yom Kippur. It is so bizarre as to make the inconsistencies inexplicable and compelling. There he is, central for us and for our children. A flawed and prejudiced human being can still be our teacher on this of all days. And I am certain this also speaks to the renewal of our souls, this Kol Nidre, holding the full bewildering spectrum of it all, because it is never too late. We live in a world that loves binaries, black, white, right, wrong, hateful or loving. But our tradition usually resists such dualities. And if I asked each of you, you might also agree the world is way more nuanced. The prophet Isaiah describes God in all God's complexity. I form light and create darkness. I bring goodness and create disaster. Just this year, Reform Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker demonstrated an ability to hold extraordinary extremes, and he touched the world. You know what he, that rabbi, did in Temple Bet Israel in Colleyville, Texas, earlier this year, when that gunman arrived with his weapon hidden, he made him a cup of tea. He talked to him and he welcomed him. And do you know what Ch Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker said after being hostage for hours, after enduring terror and that final courageous act of throwing the chair that freed them all? He said he'd do it again. He would make another cup of tea again and again. He would open the door. He would welcome the stranger. Even after he met head on all our worst fears of terrorism and anti-Semitism, 
of racism and hatred, he chose not to subdue that human instinct of openness. He insists on holding it all. I draw so much from Rabbi Citron Walker, his wily and discerning courage, his kindness, and his refusal to give up on either. And truly, that is what atonement and teshuva means this year for all of us. An expansiveness to hold fear, anger, and openness all at once. These inconvenient truths, the writing of Alice Walker, the integrity of Rabbi Citron Walker. This fierce ambivalence is what I wanted to talk about tonight. If we can, with difficulty, hold the unpalatable parts of artists whilst we appreciate the beauty of their other parts, then we can do so similarly for ourselves and each other. I am deeply shamed with my own impatience with the people that I love. How difficult I sometimes find it to recall the whole full person when one part disappoints or offends. I am not proud of this, and each year it returns as something for me to work on. Teshuva means response, return, even an answer. It doesn't merely transform the individual, but actually, as Rabbi Lawrence Kushner suggests, converts everything that was negative energy into positive energy. Because just by trying to look at ourselves, it is teshuva. Taking a flashlight to ourselves, we might see the same inconsistent extremes, albeit relatively. Parts we are ashamed of, alongside parts we honour and are proud of. Similarly, in people we love or share our lives with in some way. And inner healing requires acceptance, not chastising. Nachman of Bratslav, that extraordinary rabbi who we think suffered from depression and confusion all the days of his life, yet comes up with the most extraordinary pearls of wisdom of how we and our emotions manage the world. Nachman of Bratislav said on Yom Kippur, we should try to say, I am ready to exist as a person of worth. It provides weight and understanding, a capacity to look back and forward, in and out. It helps with becoming better, purer, more vigorous, not just an apology, but a fullness of holding. All those inconsistencies. As Walt Whitman, another mystic, wrote in his Song of Myself, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. It was Charles Dickens, he of some of those difficult views, who also wrote this sublime opening to his A Tale of Two Cities that casts a long and magnificent shadow across centuries to this very moment of us here on Col Nidre in 2022, still capturing our lives and times. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light, it was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. <coughs> That's us tonight, despairing, disappointed, tired, yet energetic and hopeful, hurt and yet recovering. Because it speaks to so much in our lives of the inconsistent truths that make up who we are and the people that we love. We are galvanized, keen to help, showing up as we established and discussed last week. There is greater concern, charity and care in our country, yet at the same time it is fair to say, slightly unravelling. War continues and so does the stealthy attack on women's lives from Iran right to the developed United States. The best of times and the worst of times, we are bruised and open-hearted after COVID, 
More is possible, but we are also damaged, angry and suspicious. What is the best and worst for you? Who is the best and worst for you? And us, inside of us, which parts are the best in us? We may be ashamed of ourselves, our inactivity, our self-focus, our sensitivity, our reactionary responses. And yet we may be proud of our resilience, our courage, our commitment, our patience, our recovery. We see hatred, prejudice towards us, and we pledge not to let it close our hearts. We are open and evolving. God in our tradition, as the Torah tells us, is of course, I will be what I will be. Nothing fixed, all about becoming. So we can rethink our reactions. Could we shine a flashlight onto our own intolerances, our own relationships? Could we unite the prayers we offer tonight and all day tomorrow with the intentions we have to be easier, more thoughtful? It's always how we are with others that creates the challenges, envy, anger, impatience, rejection. We know it all. We can change the script of our lives and the responses we have and the attempts to be more open, more tender, more brave, forgiving those who need it, appreciating the full story of others and ourselves and holding ourselves safe at the same time. The human heart is taken by the idea of mistakes and holding them close. Torah feeds us such sweet messages about it. When Moses is told to bring up a new set of tablets to replace the first set that he broke in a great expression of anger, no detail is given of how he embarrassed himself or how he lost his temper. Instead, what we do hear from a beautiful midrash is that those broken shards of the tablets, the first set of tablets, live in the same arc as the new ones, all together. We talk of newness tonight, the white of purification, but actually we bring everything with us, the mistakes, the shadows, the darkness, all those extremes that have happened previously in our lives, we bring it all with because that's what we are. We are an ark, a home for all our attempts, the ones that succeed easily and the ones that do not. The shameful feelings, the ones we're proud of and those broken shards serve as a reminder of past errors and mistakes, but also of the successes of later iterations and attempts to live. Broken shards are so important for us they help us in how we relate to each other. They build our sense of empathy for others as well as ourselves. A reality that no one gets it right all the time and we don't have to write them off, nor do we write ourselves off. We survive, we try again, again and again. We know that from our own lives and our tradition reinforces it. Sometimes from the vantage point of hindsight, we can be ashamed, annoyed by our behaviour, but the broken shards disagree. All is important. Samuel Beckett, the writer, was drawn to failure, and I love this part of him and its power to help individuals. His best known expressions of this philosophy appear at the end of his 1953 novel, The Unnameable. You must go on. I can't go on. I will go on. And then 30 years later, still in the story, Worsewood Ho, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. I read this not so much as failure, as regret, the feelings that come with shame, and who amongst us doesn't recognise that? The mistakes, the clumsiness, the dullness, all part of us and each other. Finally, I want to share a piece of Mishnah I discovered for the first time this summer from Midot. Mishnah is, of course, the first piece of rabbinic writing captured in 200 of the common era, the first time oral musings were recorded in one place. 
And here, there is a description of when the Israelites made their pilgrimage to the temple. Perhaps like all other faiths, they may have used life savings to get there. Everything is arranged and organized. Thousands journeying together, ready to process their journey on the Temple Mount. They get there, maybe staying in Jerusalem, ready to visit. They are ready with great joy and intensity. Everyone rich and poor enters the same door of the Temple Mount, walks round the courtyard in the same order and togetherness, all circling to the right around the perimeter, all together, a community together. That's what happened when the congregation came upon the temple. But then the Mishnah suggests someone else that might be there. Mishe Ero Deva, which literally means someone to whom something bad has happened. The text says, someone who has experienced something of note. That person enters from the same doorway as well, but she starts to circle in the opposite direction. Every step the same as everyone else's, but against the grain, against the crowd. And every single person who passes her and others on this anti-clockwise journey is obligated to stop and ask, Mala, what's going on with you? And this person, surrounded by people and yet in a way alone, has to answer. They had to meet each other. They had to explain and stop and talk to each other. They had to develop an empathy for each other's weakness and strength. We have to see each other. There is no avoiding. It's so for us in our domestic and personal relationships and us here in our synagogue congregation. We see the whole, the fragility, the frailty. Teshuva helps us not to excuse the inexcusable, but to strengthen our capacity to interrogate and then accept. The coping functional member of community that circles together and the part that hangs back goes the other way someone who has sustained immense suffering, all together integrated. Because as I hope I have shown, nothing in life is so separate and contradictory. All of it dwells within, nuanced and connected. We shouldn't cancel others, we shouldn't cancel ourselves. All of it lives in the ark. Doesn't mean we're not discerning, but all of it lives together. There are constant competing truths in our hearts, as in Reb Bunam's plea that I return to every year on Yom Kippur, that everyone should hold two pieces of paper in their two pockets. I am but dust and ashes in one, and in the other, the world was created for me. I am always weighted in one way, one pocket is always heavier than the other at different times. And maybe that's okay because it always has to be the case. And I wonder if that's the same for you. Confidence and shame on our same person. That's why we need clothes with pockets. Rabbi Sheila Shulman used to say that about women's clothes in particular. But pockets remind us we store what we need. We store what we need, what we keep, so we can access all of it to balance us out. Whether it be Alice Walker, Charles Dickens, or each other, we must investigate, we must acknowledge the before, the after, the weight of each person, the journeys they've been on, the shards of shattered tablets, the new ones being added always. It is not too late to reach for this, to improve, to grow, to open. As the poet Seamus Heaney wrote, the way we are living, timorous or bold, will have been our life. Can you hear that song? Mm -hmm.